printing with recycled PET bottle wastage, and converting empty spools into useful storage. Today we explore recycling and 3D printing. Recycling and upcycling is something I'm passionate about. As a tinkerer, it's really satisfying to take something previously obsolete and repurpose it into something of value. I've tried to adopt this approach with waste ready prints, with two videos on shredding prints into pellets, the second using a precious plastics open source shredder. I also tested a prototype pellet extruder with my shredded prints, but they were inconsistent in size and so were the results. I'll continue trying to get decent prints from my shredded waste prints, but I understand that not everyone can emulate this at home. So today we're exploring ways you can pair recycling with 3D printing that you can easily try yourself. Back a recycling project on Kickstarter. Every now and again on Kickstarter, you'll find a project about recycling filament. This PLA recycler is by four French students who are aiming to recycle shredded PLA at very low cost. As you can see, I pledged to receive half a kilogram of recycled PLA filament. All I have so far is a letter explaining understandable delays and a gift of a bottle opener. But even if the filament never arrives, in this case, I'm happy to simply donate to the cause. Donate your waste prints to a local collection program. If you're like me, you'll find that failed prints and prototypes of objects I'm designing build up pretty quickly. Rather than throw them away, there's a much better option. Immediately when Googling, I found an example of a local group collecting waste-ready prints. I then looked up the name DC Engineering 3D Printing and found that they had details of a program where they collected waste prints to be turned back into filament and reused in 3D printers. This example is in South Australia and they've set up a range of different collection points at schools, universities and community areas. Here's another example from Melbourne called Proto Hub, who run precious plastic shredders and have started a recycling program of their own. So next time you're about to throw out waste ready prints, hit up Google and see if there's anyone nearby who will be able to recycle them. Buy new recycled filament. Now I'm aware that sounds like an oxymoron, but let me explain. These days I do at least 90% of my 3D printing with new recycled filament. If we come to the website of my filament sponsor X3D, we can come to filaments, buy properties, and there's a category called recycled. Here we can find recycled PLA, PETG, as well as Titan X. X3D originally stocked Form Futura Reform recycled PLA filament, but it was only available in black and white. But more recently, they've launched their own complete range of recycled PLA, and it's available in some fantastic colors. When switching to this recycled PLA filament, I didn't have to do a single thing differently. All print settings in the slicer remain the same, the parts adhered as you would hope, and as far as I can tell are identical in strength as well as quality. As I previously mentioned, for some time now, the majority of my printing has been done with recycled filament. And no one in the comments has been pointing to my print quality going downhill, which speaks to the viability of making the switch to recycled. So usually thermoplastics degrade just a little each time they're remelted and recycled. So how is this possible? Let's look a little closer. We can see in the description for the recycled PLA that it's made from residual extrusion waste streams. And looking at the description for the Reform RPET, which we'll be trying in this video, we can see that it's made by reforming post-industrial waste streams into high-end filaments. Now, as this graphic suggests, this Reform RPET is particularly interesting because that waste stream comes from plastic drinking bottles. So how does this work? Anytime we have an industrial manufacturing process, there's going to be waste. We can see on this blow molded drum, there's a large amount of flashing at either end that needs to be cut off by a worker. Now smaller drinking bottles are also made from blow molding, but using an injection molded preform. But even so, there's going to be waste material from the molding process. And my assumption is that that's the type of material that gets turned into this filament. So it's not recycled in the sense that it's collected post-consumer waste, but it's still a step in the right direction as it's using material that might otherwise be discarded. RPET is available in a range of colors, and for this test, we're trying out gray. 
All of these recycled filaments come with a minimal amount of plastic just to stop moisture from getting in, and very importantly, they come on a cardboard spool. If we read the instructions on the label, we can see that the printing temperatures are pretty much the same as for regular PETG. We can also see the filament is nicely spooled and has an attractive glossy finish. Just like when I switched to recycled PLA, I didn't make any changes to the slicer, and I loaded up the filament into my Prusa Mark III, which is dedicated to printing PETG full time. Our test print is this NanoVice, which is small and requires accuracy, so it should be a good test for a new filament. The first layer of the print went down without any issues, so I knew immediately that bed adhesion wasn't going to be a problem. A couple of hours later, the test print was finished, and the only problem was a bit more stringing than I'm used to with PETG. So I lowered the temperature by 5 degrees, increased the retraction by 0.2 millimeters, and reprinted with much better results. After cooling and a quick flex of the bed, the parts were easy to remove, so that was another potential hurdle passed. So how are the results? I'd say excellent, just as good as any other PETG that I've ever printed with. The visual appearance is good, the accuracy is there, and the two mini vices work exactly as you would hope. I understand it's early days and that recycled filament is probably a little bit more expensive and a little bit harder to find. However, the more people that adopt, the more standard and cheaper this will become, so please consider. Repurpose your empty filament spools. If you've been 3D printing for a while, you know that I've got a collection of empty spools. I had this problem and I was able to solve it and two other problems at the same time. Clogging my filament storage was a collection of very old ABS filament, with many of the spools not having a usable amount left. My last problem is that I had been reorganizing my garage workshop and quite frankly there was junk everywhere. As well as old car parts that I needed to offload, every flat surface was covered in little bits and pieces. Springs, grommets, nuts, bolts, screws, circlips, you name it, I had them lying around. This spot to the left of my welding bench seemed perfect for some storage. Rather than buy new plastic parts trays, the aim was to make my own by recycling the old spools and using up the old filament. Fortunately, Thingiverse came to my rescue with these spool storage boxes by Scala J. But it was actually this remix by Makerbeck that I found first, with the changes focused on adding a sturdy handle to make the whole system portable. Both versions work the same. You print the trays, drill holes in the spools, and then run threaded rod down the inside so they can pivot open. Other pieces are then used as joiners and for handles. Pretty straightforward, but I still have some tips and alterations that can help you. There can be subtle variations in the dimensions of filament spools, so I'd recommend stopping one tray early and testing that it fits. You can also measure the internal width of the spool and compare this to the height of the SDL, scaling if necessary to make sure the tray will fit. I'd recommend upping the thickness of your walls as this is where your parts will gain their strength rather than just having high infill. This is particularly important around the hole where the threaded rod goes through because you'll probably end up opening these holes to a larger diameter to suit whatever size threaded rod you use or in my case, avoiding the need to spend money on threaded rod because I designed my own printed parts. These two yellow trays are done in the same filament and on the same printer, yet the lower one is much worse quality. On a thin wall like this, the typical strategy from a slicer is to draw thin perimeters either side and then use very fine infill to go in between them. Most slicers, however, have an advanced setting that allow you to have single extrusions for both walls as well as infill. When we look at the preview again, we can see we've got our two outer perimeters, but now a single extrusion to fill between them. The result is a better looking print, less vibration while printing, and it also prints in about an hour less time. I wanted a pretty big storage system in the garage, so I'd been printing my trays for quite a few weeks. With your trays ready, you can now turn your attention to drilling the holes in the filament spools. To achieve this, we have this printed template part, and its operation is simple but clever. One arm has a notch, which goes into one of the existing filament holes, and the second arm is rotated 90 degrees from the first, with a hole to guide our drill. If you've got one, it's best to use a drill press for this, so that the lower hole in the spool lines up with the one on top. 
Once our first set of holes is done, we rotate the template and repeat. Using this technique, we should end up with a set of four holes on the top and bottom of the filament spool. It's a little bit repetitive, but each spool only takes around three minutes to complete. When you get back to the start, don't forget to open up the top hole to the same diameter and drill through to add a bottom hole, thus completing your set of eight. I got better at clamping the template to the spool as I went, and that cut down dramatically the amount of spools where the holes were slightly misaligned and the trays wouldn't quite close flush. Normally you would now assemble using threaded rod in each corner so the parts trays can swivel out, but this is where we deviate with my own remixed parts. I wanted the stacking of my spools to be modular, so I designed this simple little part to be utilized in pairs and hold in each tray independent of the rest of the system. They're very small and if your bed surface isn't perfectly clean, you're likely to have some come loose and get spoiled. Get it right however and it's immensely satisfying the way they explode off a flexible build platform. Installation is really straightforward. We line up our tray in the spool, insert one peg from the bottom, sliding it the whole way up to the top until we can see it poking out. We then take a second peg, rotate it 90 degrees and slide it down from the top. We want a nice interference snug fit that stops it from sliding out and if necessary you can use a mallet to tap it home. The other parts I designed go at the top and bottom of the spools or act as joiners in between them and they're designed to print without support, the thin sections in the middle having just enough flex to get into the centre hole before snapping into place with a satisfying click. By using my remixed parts I was able to make the system modular which meant I could have as many or as little stacked on top of each other without the need for threaded rod. To plug the top and bottom I have my single sided piece Again, it flexes into place, is retained with a satisfying click, and ties everything together without the need for threaded rod. System ready to go and back to the garage with some metal brackets that will be mounted at the bottom and top of the whole system. I used extremely strong anchor screws to hold the brackets to the bricks. I've used these successfully elsewhere in the garage for much heavier items. I couldn't escape the need for threaded rod completely, still needing one M5 length to go down the center of my assembly. As such, my joiner pieces had a 5.5 millimeter hole printed into place. A matching bracket at the top and the system was complete. With a nut to retain the threaded rod on top, the system was plenty secure, rotated freely, and all of the drawers could open and close, as you might expect. A bonus for me was that I still had room to mount my safety gear around the storage as I had originally intended. On my CNC table, I also prepped a single spool with a long M5 bolt, drilled a hole and added a riv nut into the underside, and then installed the spool in what I hope is a handy location to store CNC router bits and other little bits and pieces. I'm really happy with how this has turned out. The only problem is now I actually have to clean up the garage. If you've got a better way that you recycle 3D printer spools or some other interesting combination of recycling and 3D printing, please let me know down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy recycled 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.